I know it was so nice in November and December. I'm like, I love this place. I, I could get used to this. <laughs> but I was just kind of living in denial. I knew this will come, you know. But anyway, but it's, it's, it's good that you're here today. Thank you for coming. We're so, so glad to see your beautiful faces today. I want to go to the message. Um, uh, we're going to read out of Acts chapter 4. And um, Acts chapter 4. And the, the title of my message, I'm going to continue with the, with, the, with the thought I began last week. I call them the series. It's a mini-series, if you want to call it, uh, War. And today's focus is going to be victory in prayer. Victory in prayer is what I'm going to talk to you about. Now open your Bibles, if you would, uh, to Acts chapter 4. You could also follow along on the screen behind me here, if you don't have one. If you need a Bible, there's a great place to get really nice, unused Bible sometimes, free of charge, sometimes very expensive Bible. If you just go to the churches lost and found, I always find the best Bibles there. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, go check out there. There are some really good study Bibles there. I was like, man, someone spent a lot of money to not use that Bible here. So anyway, help yourself. God bless you. Find us keepers. <laughs> All right, Acts chapter 4. I, I, I think um, it, with the story that we're going to pick up, I'm, I'm going to start reading from verse 23, but I think it requires, it would be better if I give you a preface to give you something, a little background of the story. So, so well, right before we read where we are reading, to give you the scenery of what was going on, Peter and John, uh, this is the church in the, in the very early part of Christianity. So these were the very early believers. And, 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 and they, were just, they just believed everything that, that Jesus said literally. They took everything in, in simplicity and they took everything literally. They, want, they were not overanalyzing anything. They were not having any theological debates or anything. They just heard what the Lord had said and, and, they, and they just lived a simple Christian life. But I tell you, there is power in simplicity. And that's our theme this year is about just a simple life. Uh, you would enjoy your life more if you could begin to simplify your life. I, 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 I challenge you, looking for ways to eliminate things that, are, that, that occupy our time and simplify. Uh, you know, I don't know how I got away. I, I, I don't know how we lived our lives without smartphones, even without cell phones. There was a time we lived life without it. They really wanted to talk to you. They had this important thing to say to you. And they called and they let the voice message. And they knew when you get that voice message, in the proper time, you're going to call them back. And they didn't lose their mind thinking and wondering how they, you know, they didn't hit you up. Now they send you a message, they send you a text message, they'll hit you up on Facebook, on Twitter, on, they, they're looking for you. And it's like, are you, are you all right? It's only been 30 minutes I was in a meeting, thank you very much. <laughs> but with all the added technology and all the added uh, additions that we have also comes things that we don't need. I'm not against technology. I love technology. But I do believe that there is power in simplicity. I think that's why the Lord made um, uh, the gospel simple. In fact, the Bible says this, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is foolishness to those who are perishing, but for us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Because once you taste the power of the gospel, you know it. They can debate yada, 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 and they can say anything, but you know what you know. Like the one guy earlier, just the chapter before one we were reading, the guy that had been healed, that had a miracle. And they, in fact, this is the guy who triggered this story over here. And he says, why is it really you that was sitting up there? He looks like him, you know. And he says, you guys can argue all you want, you argue. You can, you can debate all this. All, one thing I know is this. I met Jesus Christ. He touched my life. I used to be blind and now I can see. You can say I believe it. You could, you could debate whether it's true or it's not. That's up to you. But I know the change that has happened in my life. Yes. So the elite, the religious elite, 
The powers that be at the time brought Peter and John into scrutiny and tried to kind of, they arrested them because they were getting threatened by this movement of people that, that they were not part of the elite, but somehow they, they, they had the power of God working in them. And some of the miracles that God was using through their hands were undeniable. They were undeniable. So they get Peter and John and try to kind of um, um, uh, intimidate them and, and tell them, well, um, uh, we, we don't want you talking about this Jesus you've been going around talking about. And so they got him arrested, uh, conspired to get them arrested, and then they gave him a big lecture. And he says, we're going to let you go with a warning this time, but under one condition. Stop talking about this Jesus. You need to hash it, but we'll let you go. We'll let you go without bail. But don't talk about Jesus. And they looked at the people and said, so you think we're going to listen to you more than we will listen to what God is telling us to do. We will not stop doing what God has told us in spite of you. Whether, even if our life depends on it, we are committed to this Jesus because they knew who Jesus was. So here my story goes in. Verse 23, as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and they told them what the leading priests and the elders had said. When they had the report of all the believers, when they had the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. He says, in fact, this has happened here in this very city for Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate the governor, the Gentiles and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with, um, stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And after the prayer, the meeting place shook. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. I love this story because it records the content of a prayer that was prayed with power, with boldness. Um, um, a prayer that was a victorious prayer. It also shows us uh, a prayer, it, it shows us a model, model of prayer, but we also see the answer. So it's a successful one. I think sometimes when uh, uh, people hesitate in exercising the power that we have in Jesus when it comes to prayer, I said last week that we are in our war. Satan declared war on your life the day you were born. Maybe even before you were born, he was plotting to take your life. Uh, now, I think one of the greatest sins in our nation that, that I b believe the Lord will deliver is one time, their kids are not, their babies that are not even getting a chance at life before. Satan is out to steal, kill, to destroy. He means business. He wants you distracted. He wants you frustrated. If he can't kill you, he'll frustrate you. If he can't frustrate you, he'll steal your peace. If he can't steal your peace, he'll mess with your family. He will just go, he will not stop. He's the father of all lies. But for us as believers, we are told that we are in a battlefield that is not a natural or physical battlefield, but it's a spiritual one. But the law says that we shouldn't be afraid of that. We shouldn't be afraid of the war because he already has overcome the powers of darkness. He's given us his spirit to overcome the power of the enemy. There are times in your life that you will encounter hardship and difficulty that is just a part of life because just life happens. But there are times that you will encounter difficulty and hardship because you're being assaulted from demonic forces that are wanting to discourage you, they're wanting to shut you down, they want you to quiet up. What, what was telling about this prayer is that what Satan really wanted is that he did not want them to glorify God 
He did not want them to preach the gospel. Because the end, let me read the last verse. It says, after the prayer, the meeting, the meeting place shook, verse 31, and, and they, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Now think about that. If you're sick, you're dealing with your own problems, and you hear of somebody else that's sick, it's oftentimes easy to get consumed with what we are going through ourselves. And sometimes what Satan would want to do is to discourage you to not pray in faith because you yourself are dealing with it. Or you're broke and someone says, man, I need, I need blessing in finance. It's like, how can I pray for someone about money when I'm struggling with my own money? See, that's a lie of the enemy. Because God will use you. God, God's work is perfect. God, God's plans are perfect. These guys are saying, God, you already had predetermined our plan. And so I know at the, just the right time, you're going to meet me where I need. Yes, yes. Satan wants us to hold back because of our own inadequacies, because of our own failure to butcher our confidence, to kill our confidence. So we are not praying boldly. We are not speaking boldly. We are not speaking greatly about the things of God because we are waiting for this sense of maybe perfection to be able to, to, to be. God says, no, you will be perfected. You will be empowered as you go, as you do, as you give, as you preach, as you encourage, as you pray. As you're touching others, God takes care of your situation. He knows your address. He knows your bank account number. He knows your portfolio. He knows exactly what's going on with your life. And he is well capable of taking care of you better than you can take care of yourself. You keep on doing the business of God. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Don't stop doing what you know you should be doing. He says, do good at all times. He says, do not get tired of doing good, the Bible says, because in due season you shall reap. God is in the business. He wants people saved. We get our victory from the enemy. We walk in victory through prayer. We pray in victory. We pray prayers of victory, prayers of boldness. I am so inspired when I read this prayer and I see how sure they were. But I wanted to point out to you Five things that I see from this prayer that you can add and incorporate into your life so that you can walk in victory in prayer. How many would like to see victory in prayer in their lives? I mean, how many would say, I just want to need this enemy. If I'm preaching to the right crowd, how many want to see victory in prayer? I want to see victory all the time. I want to see victory all the time. I want to see what the promises of God come into fruition. And this kind of gives us, uh, and the first thing, five, five things that I want to give you from this prayer that we can take into our life, incorporate into our personal life. And also, another part is, also, you can enlarge your capacity for prayer. I, sometimes we can have a hand for prayer and be overwhelmed by how come my prayer life or my prayers are so limited. Well, prayer has a capacity. There's a stretching that goes on. You can grow in your prayer. You can enlarge your capacity of prayer. And I'm going to tell you, my friends, that inside of you, the Holy Spirit is in you, and you have the capacity, and God wants to expand and enlarge your capacity so that your prayer life goes well beyond your little life. Not that your life, I didn't say your important life, your unimportant life or insignificant life. I said just your little life because your God is much bigger than the things of this world. Your match is well, great, and God wants to, you, He wants your life to have a mark that would have an impact to generations that come after you. Now we're preaching. <laughs> Live a legacy that will impact generations coming after you. God is seeing that, and He wants us to be people that think like that. Okay? Our prayer life can pray into the future. Our capacity can be enlarged. Can be enlarged. It can be enlarged. I remember when I was a brand new believer, walking and, and serving God, and I'll go and I'll listen to some people pray. I'm like, man, I wish I could pray like that. I mean, I think like that. Man, I think I know how to pray. And I realized that you learn how to pray by praying. You learn how to pray by being around praying people and praying with praying people. 
You don't just think about it, you put it into exercise. And these guys, I, 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 the first thing that I want to point out that enlarges our prayer and, and, and gives us victory in prayer is that you, first thing I, I want to point out is praying with others. So it says that after they had met with these leaders and they had all the intimidating language that had been told to them, they didn't go back. Yeah, they stood boldly and they spoke their mind and they said what they're going to do. But they went back to other believers. Says, guys, here's what happened. And together, together, they called on the name of the Lord. I read that section of the passage from the New Living Translation. On the New King James, he says that they, let me read it. New King James says, um, oh boy. I don't remember what it, where it's at. But anyway, let me just paraphrase this. The one, the one verse, one translation, some of the older translations say that they lifted up their voice to heaven. I mean, there's an interesting switch of words there. It went from plural, that they lifted up their voice, singular. They lifted up, together they came and they lifted up their voice. You know what that tells me? There was such unity in the way they approached God in prayer that there was such a blessing. They, 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 they prayed to the Lord as if he was one man. That's, that's what we were attempting to do and I hope we did when we were praying for missions. Sometimes uh, physical things like joining our hands together, they're just symbolic that help us kind of say, okay, let's unify this thing up because there is power in the unity of prayer. There is power when God's people raise their voice to the Lord. When, when we as a church raise our voice to the Lord and we, and we stand for the city of Lincoln and we stand for the United States of America and we stand stand for our family that's going through a hard time and we stand for the kids that need to come back to, to the Lord and we stand for the blessings of God that makes a person rich and has no sorrow. There is power in the unity of, of prayer. That's why the Bible teaches you, there, some, there, there is biblical precedence on this. Jesus says that when you gather together, to when two or three gather together in my name, there I am right in the midst of them and also ever things they ask on earth it shall be given to them. It's the power of unity in prayer. But sometimes, well, let me not go sometimes. Let me finish this thought first. You see, I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm excited about this. I do believe that if we enlarge our capacity, if we allow the Lord to use our, our prayers and to grow in prayer, we're going to see victories. We're going to see people being set free. We're going to see miraculous things happening in the lives of people. And we will be whirled by the, by the goodness of the Lord and the work of the Lord because God wants to work with us. Amen. God wants to work with us. See, that's why we, we put prayer uh, as a very forefront here. You know, it, it, w w we sometimes complicate this. Let's say pastor might say, hey, couples, you need to pray together. Pray with your family. And immediately, we think of this formal prayer schedule time i gotta get my cars, my kids in this structured military time i want to be that praying family from now on kids come over here <laughs> i got some family business to do here from now on this house is gonna be a we're gonna be a family of prayer so listen to your father. The Bible says, obey your parents in the law right now. <laughs> this is going to be a family of prayer. You know? On Monday morning, 6.22 a.m., <laughs> the countdown clock will go. And we think of this mystified structure, and when we try to do it and we are unsuccessful, how many know that those don't, don't always play out the way we think they'll play out. Yeah. And, and the way it is, it's not about the works, it's about it becoming a lifestyle. I was like, oh, my, I, I, my husband is just, he's not, he's not, he's not, he's not the prayer man. I, I, need, I need a man that, that leads his family in prayer. I want a husband that brings us together and pray all the time. You know, we, we, we mystify this and we create this 
religion. Someone shared with me, in fact, I'm just going to give her word right now, uh, how the Lord was saying we need to get surrender our religion. We need to get rid of our religion. It's about relationship. We're there. I just said the word, a prophetic word that came during worship. And so, because we religialize everything, and that's not a word I just created it today, but it can go to the library. We religialize everything. And so by religializing it, it all, we fail and guess who wins? The enemy wins. Because now we have a family that does not pray. We have a couple that does not pray. We have a church that does not pray. We know prayer is works. We know we should pray, but we're not doing it. This, guys, this prayer meeting was not planned. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have prayer meetings. But this prayer meeting was not planned. What it shows me, it was part of the way they live their lives. They came back and said, guys, man, we had a rough time. Those guys thought they were going to intimidate us. You know, they don't know our God. And we told them, we're not going to stop talking about Jesus because we know who Jesus is. And the people said, you know, who do they think they are? Well, they're blind. They need the Lord. And I love how bold and how confident uh, their prayer was. And say, God, you are the creator. God, you did all things. God made your signs and, and wonders follow us. We've done this even with our kids, you know. And, and even Sarah and I in our lives, we, you know, we, we, sometimes like when we've learned this, like, it's in it's in, in the way we live. Like we just got done talking about our budget and what we're doing. How we're we spending our money and not spending. And what are we doing? That? Well, we pause right there and we pray of our finances. It was not a structured prayer meeting, but we prayed of our finances. You know, we got, talk, got done talking about a kid. And we pause right there and pray for them. Well, we got the pause down talking about uh, um, uh, somebody at church and just wondering, you know, that the Lord put in our hands. We pause right there. It, it doesn't have to be a two-hour prayer meeting. We stand, Lord, in unity and we pray for them. So and you, I do that with my kids all the time. I, I had a back issue the other day. I'm like, kids, somebody pray for, for me right now. And so we pray in agreement. When we start demystifying it and we make it a part of our lives, we will start seeing the power of the Lord actualized in the, in the power of the Lord in the prayer of unity. The prayer of unity is powerful. There are times you, we should all have a personal prayer life and a growing prayer life, but there are times where you need to have gather around with prayer partners. Get prayer partners. Get yourself involved in a small group. You know that. Then sometimes it doesn't have to be in a meeting. It can be on the phone. I have prayer partners, and they have, I pray over, over the phone with some people saying, hey, I'm going through this right now. Can we agree in prayer? And we'll just be on the phone for so a minute or two, and just, Lord, we know that you are in this. God, we know that you are faithful. We know that this might be what we hadn't planned for things to go this way, but we know that the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. We know that you make all things to work together for the good of those who love the Lord, those who are called according to his pastors. And so we believe that you will do something good. We rest in, your, in knowing that God you're good. You know, so Simply demystify, make it a lifestyle. Don't make it religion, make it a lifestyle. Be a part of what you do. And that's what these guys did. They focused and they gathered. And when they gathered, you know their, un their prayer was unified because of the way the writers, uh, Luke who wrote uh, Acts, accounted that, that meeting that day. He says that they got together and they lifted their voice, singular, to the Lord. Where there is unity, the Bible says God commands a blessing. Where there is unity, God commands a blessing. Even your worst enemy who tries to cast, even the demons in hell can conspire against you. But where there is unity in faith, God commands a blessing. He cannot unbless. He cannot curse what God calls blessed. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now some of you are calculating in your head if that was point one and we have five of them. <laughs> Am I going to get a seat at the restaurant today? Am I going to pass out at the church parking lot? No, you're not. <laughs> the other ones will be short, I promise. That one was just burning in my heart. It was just burning in my soul. Because there is power. And sometimes you exercise at a church. You're meeting with brothers you haven't seen, or sisters you haven't seen all week or for a long time. They share with each other. And people talk about your life. There is power when God's people come and pray together. Huh? There's power when we stand in faith. Andy, stand over. Stand here. You see, I do this to people all the time, but they are good people. Andy, what's going on in your life? 
Um, I'm putting a work. Lord, I thank you that you said you will bless the work of our hands. Amen. Lord, every time, every day he punches the clock, every good time he wakes up, Lord, it's not just going through the motion, God, but there is purpose in his life and in his work. You bless the work of his hand. Let people see God through hand his work and let the labor, let him enjoy the fruit of his labor and know that God is faithful in his life. In Jesus' name, amen. We encourage each other in prayer like that, just like that. Walking and exercise in the power of that unified prayer of believers and they join their hands together and they lift their voice to the Lord. Second thing is the thanksgiving, this concept of praise and thanksgiving. It says that they went up, if I go back to what they said, they went back and they just began to exalt the Lord. They went and, you know, they addressed God for who he was. They began prayer with gratitude and acknowledge of what God had already done and knowing how, how to expect. You see, See, this can be a whole teaching all by itself because you see it also precedence in the Bible. Examples upon examples. One in the Psalms, it says, Come into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. The Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So there's something about praise that has to be a part of our prayer all the time. Thanksgiving and praise put things into perspective. And all of a sudden, there's a deep realization of how great the God you are approaching today is and how capable he is to changing your situation, how capable he is, let your kingdom come. Father, hallowed be your name. And then you say, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth. You're, 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 so now invoking his will in your situation on earth to a God who is more than able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask according to the power that works within you. You in praise it magnifies God. It elevates God to his rightful place. Don't move him, but it elevates it in our own minds, in our own perspective, and it allows the things of the world and the things that we're going through, our trouble or whatever, whatever petition we have, it allows us to see it into a good, into good perspective of how small they are into, in comparison to the God that we, that, that we serve. Additionally, too, when comparing praise and thanksgiving, in comparing those two, thanksgiving puts things into perspective that you might have something that's screaming very loud, like now, right now, but in the scope of the big picture, you are a blessed individual. You're so blessed sometimes, Satan just wants you to forget how blessed you are, so you can lose your peace, you can lose your joy, you can be frustrated because you have something that's pressing and is frustrating you right now, but in the scope of everything else, you're like, oh my goodness, if I would just pause down and think about how good God has been to me. If I could just pause down and count the blessings that I have. If I could just count down and just begin to reflect on how fortunate I have been and how undeserving um, of, of the grace and the favor that I continually see in my life. This one trouble, I know that even then when the season is over, it's going to be alright because God will never leave me. God will never forsake me. He has a way of taking care of his people. We don't understand his ways. We don't understand his words. They're wider than us. They're bigger than us. They're more than we can comprehend. But we know this, that he is a good God. And I can be confident in knowing that even my present circumstance is not too difficult for God, my Lord. They started by glorifying God. They said, God, you are so great. You created the universe. The cosmos exists at, the word, at your word. Things go in motion. Everything is perfect before for who you are. These are things we need to proclaim in prayer. Yes. Don't just think about it. Say it. Yes. Say it in your prayer. Yes. Say it in your prayer. In congregational setting when we come in and they're leading us in songs and worship. Get up. Say things. God, you are beautiful. You are magnificent. You are glorious. We exalt you. We magnify you. We praise you. We worship you, God. We adore you. We lift you up, oh God. We magnify your name. We join in one voice to say, God, you are awesome. God, you are wonderful. God, you are good. I adore you. I lift you up. I stand in amazement of you, oh God. When I think about your goodness, I stand amazed, oh God. You are awesome. You are mighty. You are the one who was, the one who 
is the one that who is to come. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning. You are the end. I mean, the attributes of God are endless. They are endless. They are endless. You can perpetually begin as, as you allow your spiritual muscles to expand. You'll learn that the, your prayer capacity is enlarged. And you will find out that there are not enough words in the world to describe the beauty of the Lord. There are not enough words to describe the mighty power of His glory. There are not enough words in our vocabulary that can possibly assign to God the, the glory of His name. But so we, in endless attempt to just say, God, but you, what you're doing, your confession is magnifying God inside of you and it's making everything on earth that might seem sometimes so pressing, it puts it into proper perspective at how small it is in the sight of the God of the universe. Say it with your voice. Sometimes I know some of you might. I might drive you crazy a little bit. Pastor, sorry, would you land this plane? He said, come on, use your own voice. You know, you hear me say that sometimes. Before I pray for you, you say something. Well, there is something powerful when we start saying what's in, your, in our heart, how we really think about God, and sometimes how you th think about God and how you see him. Not sometimes. It would always enlarge the more you exercise your senses in invoking praise Declaring glory, exalting his name, saying it with your lips. If you can speak, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You praise the Lord. Part of your prayer. I'm telling you ways to live a victorious prayer life. There are times that you hear something, you can pray on your own, but you need to call a brother, need to call a sister. You need to get a brother, you need to get with people around, and there are times you just say, guys, agree with me in prayer, let's pray about this in my situation. Let's pray for my family, let's pray for my dad, let's pray for my sister, let's pray for my brother, help me pray for my life, let's do it together. And there's power there. And then there are times incorporating that. Praise and thanksgiving, putting everything into perspective. And I think... You got the word for today. How many received something from God? Could say, he didn't. He. How many would say, Lord, I got a word today already, okay? Okay, let me ask it again. How many did not get a word yet? Because I can go on for a long time. Raise your hand if you want more word. Okay, okay, good. I think, I feel, I feel like, I feel, I feel confident that God's given you something today to use and to encourage you. Amen. Come on, can we give him glory? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank